Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking time and joining Protector this morning. Um, it's the second of our webinars, so we're quite excited for this. Um, I think we're going to get going, and then as people join, they'll fill in. As mentioned, it is being recorded so that everyone will have access to it afterwards, but the team will reach out if you guys do need more further assistance. Just to quickly cover it, so I'm sure everyone is aware today's um, presenter is Rani Naidu from 3M. We'll get into a bit of an introduction just now. The idea is this OEM is based on respiratory, and I'm sure Rani is going to share some valuable information with all of us throughout this webinar. Um, just want to start with a quick agenda of what's going to happen through the, the course of this webinar. So we're going to start with just a quick introduction and expectations. We'll cover the, the, the idea of these webinars. Um, we'll cover quick webinar conduct because we've changed the style a little bit to hopefully increase the engagement. And then also expected outcomes and hand over to Ronnie. Ronnie will then take us from about 10 past 10 till 11ish, um, covering the, 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 the respiratory presentation. Um, that's going to cover types of respiratory protection, applicable respiratory standards, background to gas, vapor, and particulate um, filtration, gas and vapor, and particulate filter classifications, respiratory selections, as well as fit testing. And then hopefully we get a few questions and engagements afterwards. Um, just to quickly cover, so last, I think three weeks ago, and I see there are quite a few people that attended that, we had UVEX in discussing hearing protection. This week is respiratory protection. Just a bit of an idea, so Protector likes to see ourselves as solutionists when it comes to PPE. And the idea is we, we hopefully subject matter experts, but where we do lean on a lot of people is like today. We get Rani involved. Rani is probably one of the most educated people in safety. Um, talking about legislation, talking about best practice, international, local standards, the whole board. And we like to bring that to our clients. So we do cover from foot protection to eye protection, respiratories today. We deal quite a bit with confined space, hand protection, head protection, hearing protection, and one of our specializations, which is for protection as well. Just a quick conduct is we want to make this as smooth as possible, obviously, so we don't want to um, have too many interruptions, not not engagement interruptions, more um, process interruptions. So if the, the, the bandwidth starts dropping. So what we're going to ask is that we have allowed everyone's mics to be on. If you've got a question, by all means, we can put the mic on. But if we can also just shift it off afterwards, because if there's any extra background noise, it will pull away from the presentation. The second one is the video feed. I feel awkward putting my video on, so I'm not going to. But by all means, if anyone wants to put on their video, say hello, wave quickly. We're happy for that. But if we can have them off during the webinar, it's just going to ensure the quality of the feed is obviously as good as it can be. And then on to the questions. We really want questions. Rani is a wealth of knowledge. I, I, I implore you to engage with her, ask questions, but let's keep it to a process of, if you can put up your hand, Rani will then allow you or, or speak, let you know that, okay, let's have that question. Um, if she doesn't, I'll jump in if she's getting too deep into her details and quickly jump in and let you guys engage with Rani on your questions as and when they happen. And as mentioned, this is a recorded webinar. Obviously, you guys will have access to it once we are completed. Um, okay, the expectations from this webinar. So we want to add value. The idea is this is the value add. Um, so I hope the, the information that is shared is valuable. Obviously, we get the subject matter expertise in. They're going to bring international, local, and just in general best practices to this topic. Um, they'll also hopefully bring quite a bit of information of new innovations and interesting developments in the industry. And I think that that's quite a valuable point, seeing that everyone here is involved in safety. The next point is obviously to increase safety. We're hoping that this information helps you guys make better decisions. 
And we want to create a consistent webinar. So every three weeks or so, we hope to carry something like this out. Um, feedback, please, positive, negative. We really, really, really want feedback because it only helps us make these sessions more valuable to the, the people attending. And we're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for the people attending. So we really want to achieve something good there. Just a quick one about Rani. I'm not going to introduce her too much because I think she knows more about herself than I do. So I'll let her introduce you herself. But she is the senior applications engineer for 3M, which means she knows a lot of stuff where PPE is supposed to be used and isn't supposed to be used. Um, about Rani, so Rani loves bikes, motorbikes to be specific. She also is an avid lo lover of animals. So I don't think she's going to be too excited tonight when there's fireworks going off. I think last time we spoke, she told us she hated fireworks. So good luck with that tonight, Ronnie. And then just about her work side of things, she is also the technical manager from a 3M point across the whole safety spectrum. So even though today is based on respiratory, Ronnie is a wealth of knowledge a lot further than that. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Ronnie and hope this is valuable. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning and welcome. I'm going to start sharing my presentation now. OK, I do hope the presentation has come up. If someone could just indicate that it is visible. It yes. is visible. Thanks very much. Yes, it is. OK, so as Dylan mentioned, I would like as much engagement as possible and um, to get started, I'd like to welcome all of those that I didn't greet earlier. Good morning and a very warm welcome to you all. My name is Rani Naidu and I am the Senior Application Engineer for 3M South Africa. And I do thank you for joining me for this presentation focusing on respiratory protection. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I joined 3M 17 years ago in 2004, and I've held various positions in marketing, sales, product management, technical management, sales management, um, and now I'm the application engineer. So in this capacity, um, I do also control all of the regulatory requirements for PPE that 3M supplies. Um, and as a recognized key opinion leader, I often present training sessions and lectures to end users and key stakeholders. So I'm also an advocate for STEM, which is a curriculum based on the idea of educating students in four specific disciplines. And those disciplines are science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I also represent 3M on several external technical committees and regulatory bodies. So as with all presentations, um, there's always a disclaimer to uh, the presentation itself. Whilst every effort has been made to ensure that the information contained within this presentation um, is accurate and reflective of current legislation, standards and accepted best practices, please bear in mind that legislation, standards, techniques and equipment are constantly being reviewed and updated. So 3M takes no responsibility regarding changes that may have occurred since compiling this presentation. So some of the um, learning objectives for this webinar would be um, to understand the basics of the 3M respirator range so that the recipients have an awareness of the range and the considerations for using and selecting the appropriate product for the wearer and the applicant. Application. This is not designed to make the recipient an expert on regulatory aspects um, of risk management, product selection, or fit testing for that matter. A, a competent person should perform these roles. 
So I do hope you are all familiar with this chart. The hierarchy of controls is a universally accepted system used throughout industry to minimize or eliminate workplace exposures to hazards. And that includes respiratory hazards. The hierarchy details a range of controls in their order of decreasing effectiveness. So all too often, PPE and the use of respirators are seen as the only control and all others are discounted or not even considered. Personal protective equipment, um, such as using a respirator, are at the bottom of the hierarchy, meaning it is the last control or last resort that should be considered. PPE and respirators rely on proper selection and use by the worker each and every time they are potentially exposed. In other words, the worker is individually responsible. Health and safety engineers, um, not sure if there are any on the call today, but if you're a health and safety engineer, you should be working down the hierarchy, implementing or ruling out each control in turn. However, the use of PPE and respirators is often implemented for various other reasons, um, and some of which include, um, for example, when elimination, substitution, engineering, or administrative controls are impractical, uneconomical, impossible to implement or create additional hazards, or the implementation of these controls don't fully reduce the hazard to a safe level. You may also use PPE when other controls are being installed or repaired, or in emergencies or other temporary situations. Um, it can also be used if it's mandated by local or national regulatory or company policy. In certain circumstances, when exposures are beneath limits, um, but either the employer or the worker desires a voluntary use of respiratory protection. So once again, just a reminder or to sum up this chart, in your hierarchy of controls, the use of PPE should be your last resort. Now we'll take a quick look at regulation and legislation surrounding respiratory protective equipment. South Africa follows the European regulatory standards for respiratory protection. All respiratory products sold in South Africa are required to be homologated with the SABS and the National Regulator for Compulsory Specification. For this reason, the NIOSH N95 and products like the KN95, which we are currently seeing in the market, these products are not legally allowed in South Africa. Starting with the legal duties for use of personal protective equipment, as outlined in the PPE directive, it is important to note that this directive lays down the minimum requirements for personal safety. So it's always suggested that you develop your own standards with regards to the use of respiratory protection in your work environment. Personal protective equipment must comply with the relevant community provisions on design and manufacture with respect to health and safety. When choosing PPE, choose good quality products which are CE marked in accordance with the personal protective equipment regulations. Your suppliers can advise you on this. Choose equipment that suits the wearer. Consider size, fit and weight. You may also need to consider the health of the wearer. For example, if the equipment is heavy or wearers have pre-existing health conditions, 
standard PPE may not be suitable. Let users help choose it. They will be more likely to use it. In South Africa, we have two major laws that govern the use of personal protective equipment. The first is the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And here we refer to Act number 85 of 1993. The Occupational Health and Safety Act is a South African statutory law administrated by the Department of Employment and Labor. The second is the Mine Health and Safety Act. Here we refer to Act 29 of 1996. This act is to provide for the protection and the health and safety of employees and other persons at mines and for that purpose in industries. Next, we look at the respiratory hazards and our natural defenses. Believe it or not, we do have our own internal respiratory system to help us fight against respiratory hazards. Respiratory is broadly broken down into three areas, that being particulates, gas and vapors, and then areas are with oxygen deficiency. It is extremely important that you understand which one of these areas you are dealing with. To respiratory hazards devices and different types of filters have been used against different hazards. Particulate filters are not very effective against gases and gas and vapor filters are not effective against particles. Therefore, you have to understand your hazards fully before you can start to consider what device to use. Narrow down your choices. For example, You will know whether you can use a particle filter, a gas vapor. There are several gas and vapor hazards that cannot be captured. On. So you will have to consider the individual components to present it, um, the final outcome of your filter device. Oxygen deficiency must always be kept in mind, as no filtering device will add oxygen. Specialist respiratory protective equipment is needed for oxygen deficient environments. The body has a number of natural defenses to airborne particulate hazards. Firstly, we have nasal hairs that capture large particles before they get deep down into the airways. We have a sneeze reflex which helps keep our nasal passageways clear. The mucus is a thick slimy fluid coating which um, lines the airways from your nose to the lungs and it acts like um, fly paper capturing particles. The cilla are the hair cells which line the airways beyond the nose and the throat. They help move the mucus by beating upwards helping to keep our airways clear. We also have a cough reflex. This speeds up the cleaning of our airways by forcing air up through them and moving the mucus back to the back of your throat. And if substances get deep into your lungs, other more complex mechanisms such as your defense cells are then mobilized to attack the particles and help clear them up. Our respiratory system can cope with most everyday particles, like dust around the house, for example. 
But the problem with, there are problems with the following situations. Firstly, large quantities. They can swamp our defenses. If it's toxic, poisonous, or infectious particles, they can damage our lungs, our defenses, as well as other parts of our bodies. Sensitizing particles, which trigger allergic reactions, can cause occupational asthma, for example, in very small quantities. An example of this would be flower dust. and very small particles. This last category includes particles that are respirable and can bypass most of the natural defenses and get deep into our lung tissues where they are toxic or in large quantities. But mostly, the body cannot filter out harmful gases. Next, we will look at risk assessments and choosing the correct PPE for respiratory protection. This is the classic approach to determining if there is a need for um, respiratory protection, and if so, the level of protection required. This method is referred to as quantitative. The air concentration is measured and divided by the occupational exposure limit. This gives us a hazard ratio. We must pick a respirator that has a protection factor equal to or greater than the hazard ratio. But first, you need to understand the workplace exposure, and this may require personal monitoring. Then there is a need to be compared to the maximum safe occupational limits for the use of the product. And these can vary by country. Finally, we can calculate the required protection factor or redu uh, uh, reduction required um, in the worker's exposure. At 3M, we use a four-step method for selecting respiratory protection. Firstly, we would identify the hazard. Is it a dust, metal fume, gas, vapor, etc.? Next, we assess the risk. Assess the risk levels against safety standards and consider other protection that may be required, such as skin protection, eye protection, or body protection. Next, we select the right respirator. So again, do you require a disposable, reusable, half mask, full face, powered and supplied air, um, SCBA? So the choices are quite uh, vast. And then finally, we train in the use and maintenance. So train in the fitting, the use, the care, the maintenance. This is to optimize the rep respiratory protection provided. Once you understand the hazards and the risk they pose, then you will also understand what your requirements for that environment will be. Understanding the hazard points you towards the types of respirators you can use. Understanding the level of the risk points you towards the level of protection required from that device. So many factors influence the risk. We will look at the main ones for now. Firstly, the concentration of the hazard in the air plays a part in the risk. The concentration of particulate hazards is generally expressed in uh, milligrams per cubic meter. 
and for gas and vapor hazards are generally expressed as parts per million. The value measured for the concentration is used to compare against the workplace exposure limits. The second factor influencing risk is the time that people are exposed to the habit. The toxicity of the hazard also plays a part in the level of risk, but you don't have to worry or get too involved with um, the toxicity in a substance um, because this will be most likely taken into account when the workplace exposure limits are set. The combination of the airborne concentration, exposure time, and the person's breathing rate is what defines the key point. It is the overall dose that they are exposed to. So let me talk a little about PPE. When selecting PPE, we focus on three main elements. Firstly, the job, the wearer, and then the hazards. Matching suitable respirators to the wearer should take into consideration their health, have they had a medical evaluation or surveillance done, the possibility to, new, um, to wear corrective uh, spectacles, so any eyewear, other head-worn PPE such as earmuffs, and then the suitability of the wearer's facial characteristics. And this is where fit testing has a very crucial role. Matching suitable respirators to the wearer should consider, for instance, their work rate, the time they may have to wear the respirator, requirements for um, communication, and of course, visibility or their vision, and mobility. Do they need to move around in their work area? So let's look at respirator selection. If PPE is required um, to protect the employees, we need to ensure that the respirator is adequate, suitable, and that it will be worn. It is not an extensive thing and things that 3M thinks about when we design our PPE. If you are conducting PPE trials, all of these aspects when designing feedback questions or are speaking with the wearers who have trialed the PPE. Disposable respirators are available in various models ranging from cup shapes to flat folds. Reusable respirators are available in half or full face versions with a variety of particulate and gas and vapor cartridges. Powered and supplied air systems. They can offer you integrated head, eye, and face protection, suitable for use over long shifts and offers reduced breathing resistance. This is important. For instance, if the area is demarked as an IDA, um, LH area, so for those of you who don't know that acronym, it means immediately dangerous to life and health, so IDLH. In this scenario, an SCBA or an airline with a backup air cylinder should be considered. If exposure levels are high, then should not be considered. If a user is not clean shaven, then consider a powered and supplied air system. If gas or vapor protection is required, then consider a supply. 
if record keeping is not desired, then a simple disposable respirator may suffice. If reusability isn't important, then consider disposable respirators. Otherwise, consider your reusable or powered and supplied air systems. Wearing various bits of PPE all at the same time commonly causes one or more items not to work properly or they get in the way of the worker. And this can be because the various PPE are competing for space on the person's head, such as the spectacles, earmuffs, respiratory, and a hard hat. This creates functionality problems, meaning that a face shield, for instance, might become dislodged. Respirator fit can also affect communication, creating added issues. There are also comfort problems. There may be increased pressure on the nose bridge or the forehead or discomfort due to poor balance. Let's look a bit more at the um, three categories of respiratory protective equipment. So firstly, we will look at filtering face pieces, otherwise known as your um, common dust mask or um, disposable respirator. Filtering face pieces are a type of respirator that's designed to protect the wearer from inhaling airborne particulate matter. The entire face piece acts as a filtration unit and, is, um, and it fits tightly around the mouth to create a seal. Filtering face pieces are usually disposable single use items. There are various types of particulates and the following slides will look at each one in turn. So when I refer to particulates, I could be referring to dust, which describes um, a range of small dry particles. Or it could be dust fibers, obviously, and most well-known example of this is asbestos. But the risks from carbon fiber, glass fibers, insulation fibers are also very real. Particulates could also be a mist or a fog. Mists are usually formed during spray painting operations or other operations where small droplets of liquid um, is generated. When small um, droplets are formed, they can stay suspended in the air for a very long time. Particulates also refers to fumes. And fumes occur when metal or plastic is heated to a molten state from which the metal or the plastic vaporizes, then quickly cools, generating very small fine particles. We also refer to smoke. The formation of smoke happens when solid or liquid particles form due to incomplete combustion or condensation of supersaturated vapors. And we also refer to airborne microorganisms and bioaerosols. Your airborne microorganisms include bacteria, protozoa, pollens, and viruses. The relative size charge of common airborne particles illustrates more or less the well-known types of particles which we come across in our everyday lives. The scale is measured in microns, which are extremely small units. So how long can a particulate stay in the air? after they've been produced. In the workplace, many people, when they have stopped their dusty activity, often remove their respirators too soon. This is because they cannot see the hazard. The length 
of a time, a tiny particle that can stay in the air is mainly affected by its size and the stillness of the air. And once we get to about 20 microns or less, the density of the particle makes a huge difference in terms of how long it will stay up in the air. Disposable respirators um, have different protection levels and the nominal protection level for an, an FFP1, for instance, is that it offers to four times the occupational exposure limit protection. With an FFP2, it's 12 times, and for an FFP3, it's up to 50 times of the OEL. Looking at reusable respirators. Gases and vapors are both gases. It's just that they are formed in different ways. So let's start with gases. A gas is defined as a substance above its boiling point at normal temperatures. It is neither solid nor liquid and it moves freely through the air. A typical example of a gas released from as uh, would be that's gases that are released from a cylinder, such as your welding gases. A vapor is defined as a gas formed when substances which are solid or liquid at room temperature evaporates. And a good example is when you fill up your car with petrol. You smell a strong smell. This is the vapor that's evaporating from the petrol. There are standards for your um, full face respirators. So your full face respirators have three class ratings. If it's rated one, it's suitable for light duty work and low maintenance. If it's rated two, class two, it's for general duty work and include ma uh, maintainable parts. And a three rating is for heavy duty use and for firefighters and carry the most protection, durability and maintenance ability for all face masks. Particulate filters and gas and vapor filters are also classified. Do you know what is in your gas and vapor cartridge? The um, cartridge utilizes a sorbent material to filter out gas and vapor molecules. Typically, the sorbent is um, activated carbon. This activated carbon is um, treated with different chemicals um, to the surface so that they can absorb all the gases and vapors. Charcoal is um, mostly carbon. That's why it's black. It is formed when a piece of wood or other organic material has been heated to a high temperature. The color coding on, um, on your uh, um, labels for canisters and cartridges are meant for the secondary identification. So if you're unsure of what chemical cartridge you are using, look at the colors on the cartridge as that would be an indicator of what you are being protected against. And just the basic rules for gas filtration. And to explain the basic rules of gas filtration, let's use a car park analogy to illustrate how a gas filter works and show some of its limitations. So imagine this is a small commuter car park at a railway station, and it represents a gas filter. It's a busy weekday morning at 8 a.m. The car park has one entry and one exit. The car represents gas molecules, and the parking spaces are available 
um, as the surface area for gases to stick to or to be chemically bonded. And let's just say there are just 30 parking bases, which are a representation of the uh, filter capacity. Now I will click on each in turn to show you how the basic rules of gas filtration works. Here we're looking at filter capacity. If a car enters the parking lot and there are free spaces, it will be able to park. Next, we look at breakthrough. If a car park is full and there's no more free, free spaces, then any cars entering the parking lot will travel right through without being able to park. In a similar way, when a gas filter is full, hazardous gases and molecules will pass straight through the filter without being filtered. Then you know breakthrough has occurred. Next, we look at dwell time. If a car enters the park too fast, it will not be able to stop in time and it will not be able to park in any of the available spaces. For gas filters, air flowing through the filter needs to be slow enough to allow the gas molecule time to stick or react to the surface. Desorption and migration. If a car enters the car park, parks, then moves to another parking space and keeps on doing this, it will eventually exit the car park. Some organic molecules are highly active. And whilst the um, van der Waal forces initially attract them and hold them, the gas molecules can break free again. So what to take away about filtration? It can be complicated. Some contaminants cannot be filtered. The concentration of those uh, contaminants also dictates if a filter can be used. The concentration of those contaminants also dictates how long a filter can be used. A user can choose the mask that they prefer, but the filter choice is driven by the concentration and identity of the contamination in the air. And a quick look at powered and supplied air systems. Powered and supplied air systems work on a similar principle of delivering clean, breathable air through a breathing tube to a head top. There are several reasons why a person would um, choose a powered and supplied air system. It does a higher level of protection and it gives you the option to have integrated protection afforded by the head top. More comfortable and head tops do not require fit testing. The selection process for 3M powered and supplied systems can be simplified by considering these steps. The products are described in more details in, in another presentation, but this is just um, an overview. There are some applications where supplied air systems may be preferred or required to be used instead of powered air systems. In all cases, powered and supplied air systems may not be used against contaminants that are described as immediately dangerous to life and health. The respiratory performance and classifications are directly correlated to the protection factors offered by the various systems.
the three inversor flow um, system, for instance, um, is a belt mounted air purifying device. When combined with one of 3M's approved head tops, it forms a power assisted system for respiratory protection against particles, nuisance odors, and gas and vapors. The ATEX um, system is also available and it can be used in certain potentially explosive atmospheres. And they may be fitted with particulate only or a combination of gas and vapor filters. The powered and supplied air head tops are designed to meet a wide range of applications in industry. And many offer additional head, neck, and shoulder coverage, as well as integrated protection for the head, eyes, and your face. Um, you can also add hearing protection devices to this system. And the supplied air range. This can be categorized as a supplied air with a tight fitting face piece or supplied air with a head top. There's also systems that assist with um, cooling or heating the environment. So it all depends on where you're working and the application. And these systems can offer higher protection factors um, than your supplied air options. And the final step in our force to protection, and it is essential that workers and safety managers understand the risks to their health in the workplace. It is also essential that they know how to protect against these risks in the best way. And in order for them to do this, we provide a vast array of different types of training suited to different businesses and individuals. To larger accounts, we provide on-site training and we even have a mobile uh, unit designed to assist in the delivery of this training. We also provide training to our distributors so they can advise you and assist you, their customer, in selecting the corrective protective equipment for their workplace. We currently have modules um, spanning how different parts of the body work, different hazards in the workplace, and um, how it is possible to protect against them. If you log on to the 3M uh, Worker Health and Safety website, you will be able to access this information. All respiratory protective equipment are subject to limitations of use. So a contentious issue is facial hair. Facial hair and fit is one of the most common questions asked, and it does lead to fit test failures. Stubble is the worst, and various studies demonstrate this. Wearers need to be clean shaven in the area of the face seal, not only when being fit tested, but every time they use a respirator. Facial hair and fit is one of the most common questions that I come across whenever I do site visits to recommend respiratory protection. So here's an example of what is and what isn't um, acceptable. The very long beard, no tight fitting respirator, even in this case, a loose fitting helmet and head top with a PAPR would be suitable for this man. And some of the key points with regards to facial hair 
is that facial hair interferes with the fit of your respirator. And anything that messes with that fit will lead to leakage inward and outward of your respiratory system. We will now look at respiratory fit testing. Operated in South Africa yet, several countries have legislated that respirator fit testing is mandatory before using a respirator. South Africa has made small steps in this regard in that due to COVID, all healthcare workers now have to be fit tested. This is mandated. So why fit test? Negative pressure principles apply here. Tight fitting respirators rely on the negative pressure principle to work. Air will always take the path of least resistance. Therefore, a tight fisting respirator must seal well to the face or inward leakage of contaminated air will reduce your protection. Every person is different. We have different face sizes and head sizes. Our nose shapes are different, so are the nose sizes. And every respirator is different. Each model of tight-fitting respirator has its own unique shape and size. Each also needs to be fitted correctly to give a proper fit to protect the wearer. What you can do um, in the interim before you get a fit test is to do a user pre-use seal check. And it's very simple to do this. For disposable respirators, cover the front of the respirator with both hands. For unvalved respirators, exhale sharply. And for valved respirators, inhale sharply. If at any time you feel air leakage, it means you do not have a proper seal. For your reusable respirators, um, cover the exhalation valve and exhale. Again, should you feel any air leakage, it means you are, are not protected because you are not achieving a seal. So what types of respirators should be fit tested? The answer is any tight fitting respirator. Whether it is working under negative pressure or with a continuous or on demand supply of breathable air. Power turbos or continuous supplied air systems with loose fitting head tops and helmets do not rely on a tight seal to the face and therefore do not require fit testing. When to fit test? Every time you change a face piece or if you've had any kind of facial characteristics changes, for instance, if you had any dental work or dental surgery, um, you may need to be fit tested. If you are battling with the flu and you've got swelling on your face, you may need to be fit tested again. And then just to give you an idea of the types of fit testing, there are two basic methods. The first being the qualitative fit test method and the second, the quantitative. Why and when to replace your 3M um, filtering face piece or filters? The decision to change or dispose of your PPE um, varies widely by product, industry, or even the wearer. In many countries, um, any item of PPE that is used longer than one month requires um, like maintenance and inspection and record keeping. Accordingly, this uh, derives many companies to use um, disposable items, or at the very least, reusable disposable items of PPE. So you should dispose of your um, respirator when you taste, 
smell, or otherwise detect contamination or an irritation occurs. Change it when breathing becomes difficult. Increased breathing resistance occurs and the power turbo gives off an alarm. Lenses um, get scratched and your visions may, may be impaired. Um, if there's any part of your respirator that's damaged, torn or worn out. Um, is it soiled and can it be cleaned? If not, it's time to dispose. The predicted service life or as indicated by the end of service life indicator. You may need to dispose of your um, respirator at the end of the shift. Respirators, disposable respirators are single shift use devices. And finally, you may need to dispose of it in accordance with your company policy. Particle filters get clogged and become harder to breathe through. The service life, in other words, how long will it last, of any gas and vapor cartridge or filter is affected by many factors, some being the concentration and the identity of the contaminants your breathing rates, your humidity levels, ventilation, and temperature. And over time, your cartridge may become defunct and need to be um, replaced. Please remember to always replace your cartridges and your filters in pairs. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. And I thank you for your engagement. Thank you to Protect the Safety for inviting me to do this uh, webinar with you. And I do hope that you found it beneficial. I would be happy to answer any questions at this point. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ronnie. We really appreciate your time. Um, yeah, I think the floor is open if anyone does. I think, Ronnie, you can handle this from here. If I see Samuel's got a question. Hi everyone. Um, hi Ronnie, nice presentation. Um, this is a quick one. I'm just looking at uh, when you talked about the dwell time for non-powered supplied uh, systems. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about um, our, our normal uh, L cartridge as respirators. Okay, um, though at the end of the presentation you talked about it could be used for six months uh how often you know you know sometimes you have guys using these respirators for a very long time they keep it in their um, lockers and they are not able to detect whether um it has it has reached its limit okay mm -hmm. uh, how are we to ensure or that our guys uh, have this uh, apart from your training Okay. that they have this knowledge and idea to detect when they have to change their filters. Okay, so most companies um, actually do their own change out schedules because remember every situation is different. Um, your contamination levels might be lower because you've got some kind of ventilation or air extraction. Um, so your readings will be different to mine, yet we're doing exactly the same job. So what we as 3M recommend is that first you do a field trial. So in other words, you give three or five people in an area a respirator cartridge, brand new. Then you mark down the date that it was handed to them. You get them to use the respirator, making sure that they maintain it. In other words, clean it after every shift and they store it correctly and reuse it the following day. The moment they start to have breakthrough, so in other words, the moment that they can detect any contamination from either taste or smell, then you know that the cartridge has had breakthrough and you record that date and time. Now remember, for all three or five people, the time will be different because this is affected by our breathing rates. For instance, if I am sitting at my desk working, but I have to wear a respirator, my breathing is shallow and consistent 
So I'm going to draw less breaths through the air, which means my cartridge will last longer. Somebody who's shoveling cold in front of a furnace is going to be breathing a lot harder and heavier because this is heavy manual labor. So he's going to breathe a lot more through his cartridge and he will deplete his cartridge a lot faster. So you record the time that all three or five people have tasted or um, um, gotten any kind of indication of contamination and you record those times down. And then based on that, you work out a safety ratio. So if you want the guy um, to stop working as soon as he tastes, that is your company policy. Or you may say, I'm building in a 10% fail safe so that the guy can finish his task and walk away and go and change his cartridge. Once you have that schedule in place, um, it should become routine. So if you work in an area where your cartridge depleted um, in a week, then your change out should be weekly. Whether you taste the uh, contamination or not, or you detect it in any way, your change out schedule says a week, that's when you change it out. If you are working longer, then your change out schedule is a month, then accordingly every month, you should get a new pair of um, filters to put on. That does not stop you from changing out in between though, should contamination levels rise. So we can help you set up um, a ratio scale to determine how and when your systems should be changed out. Okay. Um, so you on that, you're welcome. So on that note, I'd also like to encourage you all to visit um, the 3M website. On that website, um, if you type in 3M Service Life, and you will come up with the Select and Service Life um, website that we have. And on there, if you put the contamination, so what chemicals are you exposed to? You put in the relative humidity, the type of task, you know, is it heavy manual labor or is it light work? You put in a, a couple of um, criteria as per the questions asked. It will then give you a report telling you um, just how long that cartridge is expected to last. It's an absolutely awesome tool and I encourage you all to use it. It is free. Are there any other questions? Okay, if I may ask a question. Um, for those of you who use reusable respirators, do you have um, a system for maintaining it? In other words, do you uh, have some kind of wash bay or do you offer cleaning towels for the respirators to be wiped and cleaned before they are packed away after a shift? You may go ahead, Hanson. Hi, good day. Yeah, um, from my side, no, unfortunately, we don't have. Uh, this was an eye open. I think uh, I should consider having something like that. But thank you very much for the presentation. No problem. So again, um, we've got a system which we call um, the Respirator Care Center, where we can help you establish uh, a washing system or washing routine for your respirators. Remember, you can't just wipe your respirators with any chemical because it's going to be in contact with your skin. And the last thing we want is some solvent creating dermatitis issues for your workers. So we can tell you what works uh, brilliantly for cleaning and for sterilizing the unit. And, you know, it's just a, um, a case of personal hygiene. I know I do not want to put a reusable respirator on my face after using it for a week. So there are um, easy ways to clean it. And one of the benefits of using the 3M reusable respirators is that all of them have got replaceable parts. So if at any time your respirator becomes damaged, maybe the head strap cut or the exhalation or inhalation valves have fallen out or become warped, you can buy those products and replace them. So at no time would you need to throw away your respirator unless you've damaged the face seal itself. Awesome. Thanks, Shani. I think, yeah, it seems like that's it. I think it's been really awesome and I've definitely learned quite a bit through the session. 
Um, so thanks for bringing value from the whole protector team. And yeah, hopefully it added value. Hope so too. But guys, you are more than welcome to contact me anytime should you require additional information. So with that, thank you and have a great day further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Which one?